Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to start us off by reading Loyola's land acknowledgement statement to begin the night. Loyola University Chicago community acknowledges its location on the ancestral homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which includes the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi tribes. We recognize the tragic legacy of colonization and genocide that still impacts Native American lives today. As a Jesuit university, we recognize our responsibility to understand, teach, and respect the past and present realities of local Native Americans and their continued connection to this land. Now, please join me in welcoming the provost, Dr. Margaret Callahan, to the stage. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight for Loyola University Chicago's ninth annual climate conference. I also want to welcome all of those joining us from around the world uh, via our virtual streaming tonight. On behalf of Loyola University Chicago, thank you for your commitment to engaging in this conversation on global climate change and its consequences for people and communities around the world. Care for our world is one of Loyola's enduring core values. It is embodied in our School of Environmental Sustainability and in the many ways we live what we have learned. To infuse sustainability and reduce carbon emissions across our campuses. Loyola launched a far-reaching campus sustainability initiative in 2002. And the university has reduced its environmental footprint by over 50% in the past 50 years, 20 years. Our School of Environmental Sustainability continues to grow. It now has more than 500 students and is a Midwestern leader in research and practice, advancing sustainability and environmental equity on our campuses and in the world through education and action-oriented research. In a poll of Loyola's incoming freshmen, 54% noted that the university's commitment to the environment impacted their decision to attend Loyola Chicago. Surveys indicate that environmental issues are the number one concern of Gen Z. This conference provides opportunities to discover how to turn climate concerns toward climate action. From the perspective of a Jesuit university, climate change is not only a scientific problem, but a moral catastrophe in the making. One that is already impacting the poor and the marginalized in a number of regions and is evidenced across the world. This conference looks at forced migration and the human displacement caused by climate change. Our goals are to engage our community, foster a greater understanding of the crisis in all its dimensions, and invite people to become part of the solutions. The United Nations Refugee Agency reports there are 100 million displaced people on the planet today. Think about that number, 100 million. Further, the UN estimates that over 1 billion people worldwide will be displaced before 2050. Climate change is greatly enhancing the rate of human displacement caused by extended periods of drought, flooding, hurricanes, typhoons, and wildfires that force people to flee food and water insecurity for a place where they can find land, food, and water for survival. The primary routes of human migration are from South and Central America into North America and from Africa into Europe. This conference will illuminate this challenge, put a face on displaced people, and demonstrate what the Jesuits have done and are doing for refugees worldwide. It draws inspiration from Loyola's deep commitment to social justice and addresses the need for equitable solutions to this climate crisis. As in past years, 
We will open this 2023 conference with a performance by students from Loyola's Department of Fine and Performing Arts. Dr. Kirsten Hedegaard, Director of Choral and Vocal Activities and Assistant Professor of Fine and Performing Arts at Loyola, will introduce our performance and performers tonight. Again, welcome and thank you for being here. As the singers assemble, I'd like to take just a moment and introduce the song that we'll be singing for you this evening. And thank you, Nancy, for inviting University Chorale to join you this year for the Climate Change Conference. Tonight, we are sharing the new song, Courage to Care, written by composer Sean Kirshner, composer in residence of the Los Angeles Master Chorale and collaborator of the Eco Voice Project. The New Earth Ensemble, along with some Loyola students, premiered this song at the American Geophysical Union meeting this past December, and we are excited to share it again with you this evening. Sean wrote this song as a contribution to our new Eco Voice Songbook, which is an initiative to commission leading composers across North America to create community-friendly songs that inspire climate action. Although the songs will be composed in a variety of styles, they will all be designed for collective singing, since the power of music and its unifying potential are amplified through participation. Courage to Care is written in a loose gospel style with a call and response format. The words will be projected on the screen, and we encourage you to join along as indicated. Don't be shy. That's all.
another hand for those young people, please. <laughs> Courage to care. So, um, I was really moved by that, and um, some were brought to tears by that song. It is a, a cry, it is a plea that we are being beseeched, begged to do something. We possess knowledge that we've never had before in the history of humankind, and yet we have never been more captured by darkness ignorance and indifference. There is an African saying that to know and not to do is not to know. And one of the things that this climate conference forces us to do is to make a choice. And the clock is up. You know, the language used to be the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking. What this year's theme is about is that the alarm has gone off. We are beyond solving now. This is mitigation. Can we make it less bad? That's the reality of it. We can't sugarcoat it anymore. But I am encouraged because this school, the School of Environmental and Sustainable, of, used to be the Institute of Environmental Sustainability, but now it's the School of Environmental Sustainability, should not exist. Of course, it needs to exist. But in today's world, it should not exist. As you've seen up there, I work for Chicago Public Media, WBEZ. I'm Steve Bynum. Um, for nearly 20 years, I produce Worldview with Jerome McDonald. And at the heart of that show and its mission is peace, empathy, and action. And so it was a perfect partnership when I met Nancy and Zach and Rachel. And um, this thing called the Institute for Environmental Sustainability, I didn't understand it, I didn't get it. And I. I when I walked through the building and saw it, the first thing I said to myself was, why? Who would, who would invest in such a thing? I mean, it's extraordinary, but who would do that? Well, of course, the Jesuits did. That's who did it. Because Jesuits understand that you don't come to school just to make money. You come and learn and commune in order to make the world better. And that is at the heart of what this school is about. It is why I've had a years long relationship with Nancy and this school. It is why we broadcast the show live from this school. It is why when Nancy asked Jerome McDonald to moderate, he said, of course. And when she asked me to moderate, I said, of course. And most importantly, it is why my wife, who's sitting in the audience, and I sent my, our son here, who is a graduate of the school. Stand up, Josh. <laughs> There was no way that I could not push my son, and I pushed him, <laughs> to be a part of this movement and this mission. And so this is my heart being here. This is not a task or an obligation or a job. It is my, ob it is, it is, it is my calling to speak to you and to those of you who are tuning in virtually. Um, you souls out there who, you know, we kind of got over it and decided that coming together was what we needed to do regardless of how we do it. And so there are so many people here and hundreds that are out there, and, and I'm so grateful that you're with us. And it is my honor and privilege to introduce the people who are going to speak to you. Um, it, amongst our panelists, we have a healer a searcher, an artist, and in virtually, from another country, a solver. 
And so before I introduce them, I just want to say one thing to all of you young people, to those glorious young people who are singing, to those young people out there, I am sorry. I am from Generation X, and from my generation, and those who are older, we left you a mess. And it's ironic that we are tasked with advising you. We, who have brought the world to a point of catastrophic consequences, we who have brought ourselves to the point where life expect expectancy is down, where millions of people are having to travail and leave their homes and be uprooted in order to find shelter elsewhere because of our indifference, our negligence, and our greed. Yet we're supposed to advise you. <laughs> yeah, well, we are inspired by you, and we are learning from you, and we are honored to be with you this evening. And so I see this as a conversation where we can impart wisdom of our lived experiences and then you can tell us to be quiet because you're gonna get out there and march on Daly Plaza and cut school when you're 15 years old. You amaze me. You'll quit a job without having a job. <laughs> you will. You will not be controlled and owned by this system. And you fully understand that this system, its purpose is to make us consume in comfort without thought to consequence, and you are changing us in that regard, and I thank all of you. <clears throat> Eva Umahosa is a Burundian refugee, and because of the machinations of our visa system, he cannot be here with us, but through the magic of technology, he'll join us remotely. He knows this up close and personal as a climate refugee, an educator, a scientist, having worked with refugees around the world, and he will tell you his story. Shelley Copelson works with the Rand Corporation. Interestingly enough, on our show, we spoke a lot about the Rand Corporation, and it, the Rand Corporation has a very complex history. The Rand Corporation today is leading in presenting information to get people, businesses, corporations, governments, stakeholders to change their thinking. Father Tom Smolich is on the ground. He is a Jesuit priest. He has made the ultimate sacrifice to marry the church in order to serve humanity for all the days of his life. He takes in these refugees. He is on the front lines, and he is the one who is in a constant state of triage in order to fulfill the mission of his life, of his beliefs, and of this university. And then there is Michael Nash, our keynote speaker. Michael Nash created a, sem a seminal work and it's not hyperbole to say that. He created a shift, a paradigm shift in his film, Climate Refugees. The name itself, controversial, he'll tell you about that. Traveled the world and co-suffered with people in unimaginable conditions, but he had privilege in that he could leave. And so his heart and his soul, on many occasions, had to be left behind and stepped on with those people that did not have the option to leave or were forced to leave because of climate. And he's working on a number of enormous uh, projects with the people who make the decisions. And he's, being, he's in a position now to speak truth to power. And I look forward to you meeting him and hearing from him. And so, with no further ado, Soon, you will meet Mr. Nash, but before that, we would like to play a clip from his art in the hopes that it will move you, inspire you, and shake you to your core.
Leonardo and I first noticed the name Michael Nash about 10 years ago. We saw a film documentary called Climate Refugees, and we were both so impressed about it. I determined that I wanted to try at least have a hand in producing or being involved with making environmental films, and so did Leo. And we met Michael several times, and over the years I've worked with him on and off intermittently on quite a few, a few different projects. And I would say that he has an incredible overview, a geopolitically and environmentally, about what's going on in the world that is so useful and his he's so methodical about his thinking and his approach that he makes an excellent partner. His capabilities are really astounding. I wouldn't hesitate to work with him on anything. Climate change is on a complete collision course right now with civilization as we know it. We've had lots of civilizations collapse in the past from environmental causes. I'm certain climate change has occurred. Our responses at the moment are inadequate in terms of coping with these newly displaced people. These are really the human faces of climate change. Nature is now at war with us. We're going to have to rethink climate change as being some remote environmental issue that the scientists will work out over there. It's so huge. It's so big that's coming our way. It's almost beyond comprehension. We are the same. Human race. No difference. We're dealing with the fact that there's a gap between what the law provides and what the world needs. People cross borders all the time. When you get scarce resources, or if you get a change so radical that people can't function, uh, you have huge displacement. The threat of refugees as a consequence of climate change is an enormous national security issue. Europe is spending millions to defend itself against immigration from Africa. When the Pentagon begins to think about what might happen, that's a clear indication that we have to start taking something seriously. This is not a 100-year or 50-year issue, it's a present issue. It already is affecting the price of food you're putting on the table. It will affect the price of energy that you pay for your home and your automobile. We can meet this challenge. We can transition to a low-carbon economy. We can invent our way out of this problem. We ought to be able to come together, not red versus blue, but in a red, white, and blue way. The challenge is no longer to save the planet. The challenge now is to save civilization itself. And that is not a spectator sport. Good evening, how is everybody? Good, I, I'm really excited to be here. I mean, especially after, you know, being able to witness those singers and bring a lot of us to tears. It just really fuels me on why I do this on a daily basis. Um, I'd like to thank the university, Nancy, um, for having me speak tonight. I'd also like to, you know, uh, thank them for having the other speakers that are coming here. I'm looking forward to hearing what all of you have to say as well. I am not a scholar. I am not a uh, scientist, not a professor. 
I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. I'm a filmmaker. And tonight, I'd like to share a story with you about how this film came about. And it really started all in 2007 on a really a simple thought. And the thought was, is there a human face of climate change? And if there is, what does it look like? Is there anything we can do about it? Where are they? And from that, um, I started to do some research on this issue. And, and let me give you a little context of what was going on in 2007. For most people, besides like really knowledgeable climatologists, climate change in 2007 was about polar bears, it was about Greenland, and it was 50 to 100 years away if it was ever really going to happen. So this thought of, is there a human face of climate change, was really foreign. It had never really been talked about before. And so when you create a movie, you start creating an outline, and you create that outline based on data that exists, peer-reviewed articles that exist prior to that. Well, when I started collecting data on this, there was nothing. There was no peer-reviewed articles. There was no data about mass migration due to people running out of water and food because of climatic shifts. There was nothing. And so when I, I knew I would never get this set up with a network because I really had no story, right? I wasn't sure how this movie was gonna end and for someone who's financing a movie, that can be a little bit scary. But what I did have was a metaphor. And when you make movies, what the movie really becomes about, or what the core of a story is all about, is the tonality and the theme of that. And the metaphor that I had of what this film would be that I shared with people, trying to convince them to give me funding to travel around the world in search of something that I wasn't even sure if they existed or not. And the metaphor that I shared with them was, there is a woman who's swimming in the ocean and she gets attacked by a shark. And two guys witness this, one guy from down the beach from the left side and another guy you know, to, to, to the right of her. And she's able to swim to shore, but she's bleeding, she's gasping for her last breaths, and these two guys run down to help her. And just as one guy is about to like, lean over and you know, try and resuscitate her, the other guy goes, did you see the size of that killer white shark? And the other guys, that wasn't a killer white shark, that was a tiger shark. Well, these guys get in a fight over what type of shark it is, and the woman dies. This film, to me, was always about the victim. The woman that was laying, you know, right in front of these men who were, you know, who was bleeding and, and gasping her last breaths. And so with that metaphor and with that kind of theme, we traveled around the world. We started our journey in 2008. We went to 48 countries search of the human face of climate change. There are many places that we did not find. We would speak to scholars and professors and climatologists, you know, trying to get any information we could on where these folks might be. And once we spoke to the right folks, what we found out was, was really, I mean, it was almost more than we had ever thought we would come across. And what we came across was an intersection in civilization where overpopulation, overconsumption, lack of resources, and a changing climate were slamming into each other. And the outcome of that collision was migration. The other thing that we saw was it seemed to have, no matter where we went, whether it was Lake Chad that was a freshwater lake that supplied you know, the drinking water and the water to be able to irrigate and grow food for four countries. When that dried up, um, it seemed to be all about countries that had too little water or countries that had too much water. Water is a key driver in all of this. It wasn't about temperature, it was about water for us. Perhaps the most tragic thing is that these countries around the world that have been suffering or perhaps on a very fragile basis existed with limited resources, climate change is, 
It's just plain hell with them. It has a bullseye for them. Make no mistake about it, climate change has a bullseye for the poor. We documented that around the world in over 30 countries. It also has a target on the back for women and children. Now that may sound a little bit crazy, but what we found when we traveled to these countries that were struggling from lack of water or too much water was the men traditionally left and went to cities to try and generate revenue because there was no revenue to be made. And the women and the children were left to fend for themselves. As Margaret said, there's over one billion, uh, or the United Nations has the number at one billion. If we look at what's going on with what's coming across our border in Mexico right now, a couple million, a couple hundred thousand, look what's happening across the Mediterranean and from Ukraine into Russia, or into uh, Europe, we're talking about the po three times the population of the United States being forced to relocate on lands that they've lived on for hundreds, if not thousands of years in search of food, water, and shelter. Basically, basically Maslow's hierarchy. You know, I don't think people cross borders for tin or copper, but for water and food, they will go wherever they have to go. And so no one, regardless of whether you're living in Chicago or Minneapolis or no one's going to outrun the storm. Everybody is going to be affected by these billions, this billion people that are going to start moving around. Um, I, I just wanted to like show some of these faces, and, and these are people that we met as we traveled around the world. Every single face that's up here um, has either been relocated, is about to relocate. Um, or has, is setting up for relocation in the very near future. And one of the things that I always hear from friends of mine in America, well, they, you know, going from, uh, you know, a bad part of, you know, Tuvalu to New Zealand, like, who wouldn't want to go there? These people don't want to leave. You're going to see a video a little bit later on from a gentleman who lives on an island of Tuvalu. Tuvalu is an island in the South Pacific. It's the smallest island or the smallest nation in the world that gets a United Nations vote. And when I was speaking to this gentleman, he told me that he wasn't going to leave his island. He was going to go down with his island for many reasons, but one of them was because his wife and his parents were buried there. So when you start talking about people relocating for food, water, and shelter, they're also leaving their culture behind. One of the things that I, and, and whenever I get a chance to speak to young minds, um, you know, I, I would share with you that, you know, if, if you're looking for a life of purpose, this subject matter needs so many smart, kind people to get involved with it, whether you're an attorney or an engineer or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, I, I would really push you guys to Think about getting into this, because it is going to be uh, a thing that's, that is greatly going to change the world that we live in. And I think it, when you look at this, you have to kind of look at the litigation. I mean, look at this little girl. You know, I, 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 and I tried to take these photos where you could look into their eyes and into their soul and realize that they have the same needs and wants as we do. They want to be able to love, they want to be loved, they want to be able to educate their kids, they want to protect their family. It's really all about litigation, mitigation, and adaptation when we kind of, kind of look at the, the thousand foot view of how we kind of you know, try and start solving some of these problems. And it is up to us to solve these problems. These folks that I'm showing you right now, they do not have a voice. We are their voice. This woman was in Bangladesh. She was this beautiful woman. She was only maybe, maybe four foot seven. Um, and she said something that we heard in multiple places wherever we went. And in the interview, she was crying and praying that God would forgive her. 
and she was praying for the safety of her grandchildren and her children. And when I asked her, I, I'm not sure I, I understood, because we had translators translating um, everything to, to me, and, and I was like, I'm not really sure, you know, God forgive you for, for what? And she was like, well, he's punishing us for, you know, all of this change because of what we've done. And this happened in many places around the world that we went to. And, and I, I tried to explain to them that, look, the science is out on this. You know, you didn't cause this. This is caused, you know, this is being fueled by what the industrial revolution has done. But this is, a, this is how people are struggling around the world. So you talk about mental wellness and anxiety and depression that is coming along with all of this. Um, and no one's really dug deep into the, the, the anxiety and depression issues of this of climate change and the human face of it. Look at the intensity of, 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 of those eyes. This gentleman right here, I'm sorry, I just went by it. We were, this was in Bangladesh as, as well, um, in the Sundabar region. We happened to be there when Cyclone Sitter hit. A million people in a weekend got displa displaced. And what's different when a storm hits Bangladesh than what it hits New Orleans, and by no means am I trying to minim minimize what happened in New Orleans, but when a storm hits New Orleans or Fort Myers, FEMA comes in and these people have insurance companies and they build their life back. When a storm hits a third world nation like Bangladesh, there's no money to come and help these folks. They are on their own and most of them end up move, moving into Dhaka and living on the streets and were homeless. This young boy holding the notebook ran up to us as we were leaving and putting our cameras away to leave for the day. And he actually spoke fairly good English and he said to me, um, please, will you do me a favor when you, when you go back to your country of America, tell America that we are counting on them to help us. This kid should have been playing soccer at this age, but he was chasing me down to tell me the importance of America understanding how they are living. Bangladesh, a, a country of 155 million people that are basically living at sea level. 155 million Muslims, and when they are forced to relocate, their two borders that they probably are going to go to is either India, which is Hindu, or China, which is communist. What happens then? There's a, um, I'm trying to find this one you know, shot here. There's that little girl again who just ripped rip my heart out when I saw her sitting there just that happened to be in India. So this is a video of the gentleman that I was telling you about in Tuvalu. Um, no one's ever seen this video before. We had like 30 seconds of the clip in the film. But if we travel, as I traveled around the world, no one's words spoke louder to me and were more profound than this simple man in Tuvalu who lived off a bread plant bananas, and fish. For most of his life, he sold books in the church bookstore. And, I mean, we spoke to some high-end politicians and some great scientists and professors. Just, I'm excited for you guys to, to just hear the profoundness of, of what, what, his, what his words are to the world. I have seen a lot of changes now. Some of the, the islands, small islands, that mean are washed away by this, the current. And one island is completely out now. That's a, 
a big change now. We have seen those. They believe? They, they believe that uh, God never destroyed the earth. Yes, true. God doesn't want to destroy them. But this is different. This is what I say, man-made disaster. express also, to think about, it. because we are human, no difference. Where you live in a big country or a small island, we are the same, human race, no difference. If they suffer, we are suffer too, no difference. Men made by God, the same. But the principle, love one another. That's the principle, Christian principle. Whatever, different in color, different in language, different in custom, but we are one. Love one another. That's the basic. If we love one another, no war. No war at all in the world. But that's the different. Someone hates one another, and um, they are so powerful. You think about that. <laughs> Every day, dying, children, women. Oh, they blame each other. <laughs> what about? We are Christian, we should love. Love one another. Even we are different. But we should, if we stick to the principle, that's the principle. Love one another. No trouble in the world. <laughs> but fail, human being, fail to comply with the principle. But God, love everybody. It's true. Mm -hmm. what, what about your grandchildren? What do you think about them? I mean, do you worry for them? Oh, yes, um, I tell them. What do you tell them? I tell them if they want to migrate, they have to migrate. It's up to them to think. If they want to stay here, it's all up to them. It's not my decision. It's all up to them. Because I never know what will happen. How old are you? 74. So what's going to happen with you? To me? I don't care. I have to, I have to stay here until I die. Mm -hmm. Everybody is uh, living in the world sometime, everybody. So I am willing to die in here on my home island. I already discussed the matter with my children. If they want to go, they have to go. But to me, I don't care because I am come to the age of 74. It says in the Bible, eight, 70 to 80 years for the life of the human being. That's all. So New Zealand is uh, it's still big enough to settle our people there. It's still big enough. Why they don't like us? Because we are the same. No different. No different at all because we are the same. Hmm? But that's a different because they classify people. That's the trouble. They classify people. That's the big problem. That's the problem all over the world. They classify people. What I learned. They say you are poor. <laughs> you are not educated. That's not fair to me. If they are not, you have to educate this man so that he can learn something for his life. That's a, that's a problem. They hate. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the principle. <laughs> that's why they happen things. In Africa too, I heard about the party. Why they do that? Why they do that? 
You think to yourself, why they do that? Different people. They classify people. In India, too, I learned. Some people are classified. And some people are not allowed to go such a place. Why, why, why they do that? Why do they leave, always leave the people where they are living dumb or things like that. And they don't care about these people. Why do they do that? We are the same. When you live in part of the world, we are all human beings. No difference. But they classify people. That's happened a lot of trouble. Some people are so rich, so plenty of money. They can't use the money because it's so much, so much money. Oh, what they, they don't think about <laughs> the poor people. Mm -hmm. They don't never, 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 never. Very hard for them to think about uh, poor people. But they have a thousand and thousand money. They can never use those money. But they are so greedy. They keep the money for, for himself. See? But one day he will die. It's no difference. No difference at all. Where you put your money? Millions of dollars, where are you going to put those money to? You, you can't take the money to heaven, no? <laughs> but you never share the money with the poor people. This happened all over the world. Here in Tuvalu, I don't think anybody can have more than uh, 30 or uh, 50,000. Maybe one man can more than a half a million dollars, only be one man. <laughs> but they, we are live happily. No, 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 no difference. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? I just uh, tell the leaders of the world to think about us. Too well. We are so little, only ti tiny, I don't know, 10,000 people. But they should uh, think about us because we are human. We have to survive. That's all right. Really just a simple man that has incredibly profound words that I, th I think, you know, the, the world should hear. Um, I just want to tell you before I leave that we are in the process of doing Climate Refugees too. Uh, we hope to have it out in the very, very near future. I've partnered with the DiCaprios on it, along with the United Nations. Um, our hope is currently right now, there is not one international law that gives asylum or protection to refugees from a, that are persecuted from climatic change. We hope to change that. We hope in this film we'll create a blueprint where G20 countries can start having an intelligent conversation about creating a new dynamics for all of this. The other thing that I, that I will leave you with, and in, in, the, in the end of this film, I have this chapter in my head called Tomorrowland. And Tomorrowland can go one of two ways. Tomorrowland can be everything that we ever could hope it could be. We could create such cool things and make our future so unbelievably kind to everybody. All we have to do is get going. Or Tomorrowland could be really nothing short of apocalyptic. The choice is ours. It's everybody in this room. It's everybody who's watching this online. The choice is ours. And I'll leave you with a statement that our first film ended with, and the statement is that I believe that you guys, you young minds out there, that I'm always so excited to get in front of and talk to, I believe that you guys, you're the generation that future generations have been waiting for. And future can judge you one of two ways. Because they will look back on this moment, and, they, and, and, and I believe because of who you are and why you are and you're so purpose-driven 
that you're going to make the world a much better place for people who are not even born yet. So I welcome that. Well, <clears throat> this is the portion of our gathering where we will have a conversation. And um, we were very intentional, um, the organizers, about making this a, an intimate evening um, where we can you know, discuss, learn, and grow, bond, commune with one another. So just um, before we get started, to let you know that at the end of our talk, um, we will have, we already have one, there'll be two microphones set up where you can ask uh, questions of our panelists. And um, is, um, is Eve, is Eve um, coming up soon? There he is, Eva Umuhosa. Thank you, Eva. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Loud and clear. Where are you? I'm currently in Turin, Italy. Beautiful. I can see why you're not here. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you know, it's, um, oh my goodness, so it's probably about 3 a.m., 4 a.m.? Six hours right now. Six, oh, it's yes. six hours? Yeah. Oh, that's the time change, yeah. So um, thank you so much. So it's 3 a.m. for 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 yeah, 11, 12, 1, 1 a.m. Or so. Yes. So we really appreciate you um, being with us, and we hope to make it worth your while. Uh, and so, uh, you know, let's just, you know, Michael, you just spoke, and there are, um, are a number of things that jumped out at me. One, so when you talked about um, climate, there being a target on your back, and I want to get back to that. But um, first, what we're going to do is um, have everybody. Um, speak to you for a few minutes and um, so that you can get to know them and the work that they do. And then afterwards, we'll have um, a discussion in Q&A. So who's first? OK. So um, Eva, it's on you. Oh, my name is Eva Muhoza, and I'm originally from Burundi, but I grew up in Zimbabwe as a refugee for 26 years. I'm passionate about climate advocacy and refugee education. Growing up, I noticed uh, the circumstances in Tonguga refugee camp and the kind of situations that refugees are subjected to. I noticed the challenges, uh, which includes uh, the lack of employment for graduates. Some refugees spent most of their lives staying in the camp, depending on humanitarian aid. And we see also that refugees spend most of their life. Uh, we also see that uh, many young refugees are volunteering in the camp, to, to just mention a few. Uh, my dad was uh, a learned person, and so when we arrived in Zimbabwe in 1998, he managed to secure employment at the University of Zimbabwe. And from then, he, we, we, we were led to, to stay in, in the capital city, which is Harare. But then the, the circumstances are subjected on refugees does not matter whether you are in the camp or whether in the main city, we are all going through the same, uh, uh, we're all experiencing the hardships of uh, what being a refugee really is. Uh, so when my, when my dad uh, passed away in 2016, a lot of things shifted. And from then my family, we had to depend on humanitarian aid. And from that time, that's when I got to know more about Tonguga Refugee Camp. So Tonga Refugee Camp is situated uh, 440 kilometers from the capital city of Zimbabwe. 
and it hosts uh, mainly three uh, groups of refugees, uh, the ones coming from Burundi, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. In 2019, Zimbabwe was affected by tropical cyclone Idai, which resulted in the destruction of people's properties, which includes households, and also a number of people died. Tongoga refugee camp was heavily affected by tropical cyclone Idai. It destroyed refugee shelters, schools, water systems, and as a result, the refugee community could not gain access to education, water itself. A lot of properties were destroyed. From the age of four years, uh, owing to the situation in, the back, in Burundi, uh, my parents could not uh, go back uh, due to fear of persecution. So we stayed in Zimbabwe. That's where I grew up. I did my education there from elementary to tertiary education. And then I then received a scholarship from the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees and Partners to come to my master's in Italy, where I'm currently in. Living as a refugee, I observed the impact of climate change uh, and how it uh, the impact of climate change on the refugee community, as well as um, the legal and socioeconomic barriers that are imposed on refugees. And so this is what basically led me to get involved in, in, in voluntary work with UNHCR, where I worked on biogas digesters, which were installed in the camp. I also developed interest in advocacy work in line with climate change and refugee education. And last year, I was privileged to get selected to become a member of the Canada Refugee Education Council. And as a council member, I developed so much skills by learning from other uh, youth advocates. And also, um, I was privileged uh, to gain opportunity to represent my refugee community and advocate for issues that matters to them on various high-level platforms. A year ago, I observed uh, escalating circumstances in Zimbabwe due to enhanced load shedding, and moreover, in Tunguga refugee camp, we see that the refugee communities, they lack access to sustainable energy sources. We see that most refugees, they make use of charcoal firewood for cooking purposes and other uns unsustainable sources of energy. So this led me to establish Assorted Energies International. And together with my team, we were privileged to secure funding from the Women's Refugee Commission, which is based in New York, through the Global Refugee Youth Network, which enabled us to implement a three-month a three-month project in the camp. So the activities that we carried out includes, firstly, we we, we did some awareness campaigns where we raised awareness in the camp on the impact of climate change, how to mitigate it. We distributed uh, flyers in order to mobilize the community. Secondly. We also went on to offer some information sessions to refugees in the camp, including uh, women and girls, by training them on various topics from climate change to uh, how to install, how to design solar systems, basically the basics of solar, of, of, of solar energy. And at the end of the sessions, we gave our certificates to all, all of our attendees. And we noticed how so many people were so passionate to learn about climate change and contribute to addressing solutions within the, their, their community. But the challenge uh, that, um, that uh, the, the refugees, uh, but the challenges that they face as refugees, as refugees is what restricts, um, um, is what restricts us from actually excelling. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we also went on to donate so solar-powered systems to two other refugee youth-led initiatives in Tongoga refugee camp. And we saw the total capacity of 5 kVA, which enabled them to gain access into, uh, to gain access of, uh, of electricity, and at the same time, it made their work more effective. And then finally, we also distributed solar lights to vulnerable people in the community, uh, those who are living with disabilities. And also besides myself, I would say that there are so many youth in Tongogara who are 
engaged in different project implementations that are addressing climate change. But I think the most, some of the things that they lack is financial aid and also they lack support of their work. And uh, from, so some of the, some of these uh, youths, uh, I just want to mention just one of them. There is the Transformation Innovation Hub, which identified the lack of, uh, of climate education within the community. And so what they did was they gathered plastic bottles throughout the camp and out of those plastic bottles, they built an entire house from, from it. So this shows the resilience of young refugees and various innovations that they are making within uh, their communities. They are leading solutions that work. But what we lack as refugees, as youth, is the opportunity to scale our work. And um, I think it's really something that's um, crucial to involve within the decision-making people with lived uh, experiences to involve refugees because refugees, they have a lived experience. The climate crisis is a global crisis and it takes collaboration and togetherness. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, Chief Executive Officer and Chief Engineer at AEI and Climate and Refugee Education Advocate. And now we're going to hear from Father Tom Smolich, International Director of the Jesuit Refugee Service. Thank you, Father. Steve, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to be here with you this evening. I have a slideshow which I think is going to come up. That's me. I'm in my eighth year as, the, as international director based in Rome. From my voice, you can tell I'm not Italian. I'm a West Coast Jesuit. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. Hmm. Not everything is there, so we'll see how this goes. Dr. Callahan mentioned that there are over 100 million forcibly displaced people in our world right now. And the reality is that more and more, climate change is a driver of that number. But as Pope Francis says, it's not about statistics. We're talking about real people. So I'd like to share that real people look from a couple of different aspects. One is to talk about the forcibly displaced people, that 100 million. As Michael mentioned, women and children bear the brunt of this. 40% are under 18, and children bear the worst in climate stress. 74% live in poor, lower income countries. Before Ukraine, that number was 85%. That's where the bullseye is. In poor countries, that support people coming from other poor countries. Most live in urban areas, vulnerable cities on coasts. It's not easy there either. And finally, I think the most stunning statistic, if you are displaced for five years, you are probably going to be away from home more than 20 years. If your land has turned to sand, you are not going back home. And more and more uh, resettlement in the global north is becoming a dream not a reality for most people. That's a picture of Dolowato camp in Ethiopia for Somali refugees. And let me turn the focus to Somalia itself on the Horn of Africa. We probably know, all know a little bit about Somalia, the second most fragile country in the world. By some measurements, the second poorest country in the world. And currently in its sixth failed rainy season, three years without rain, two rainy cycles every year. It should be starting right now, and it isn't. So what does that concretely mean for the people of Somalia? A snapshot of the diaspora right now. 
Six failed rainy seasons has brought more than 2,000 people crossing the border into Kenya, into Dadaab refugee camp each week. Another 800 are making a longer trek to Kakuma refugee camp in northwest Kenya, where the drought is also having an impact. And that picture of Doloadu, we work there. And the people we work with say, we would love to go back home, but we can't because we can't support ourselves. So there's 800,000 Somali refugees and another 3 million Somali internally displaced people. That's 20% of the population of Somalia. If that percentage were in the US, 67 million people in the United States would be displaced. That's what forced displacement looks like right now. And this one is all about climate change. 42 years ago, Father Pedro Arupe was deeply moved by the situation of Vietnamese refugees. And he called on the Society of Jesus to begin a response that was human, pedagogical, and spiritual. And that's what JRS has been trying to do for these 42 years, to accompany, serve, and advocate for and with forth, forcibly displaced people so that they may heal, learn, and determine their own future, have agency in their own lives. This is our impact from 2021. We don't have the numbers from 2022, but they will be bigger because of Ukraine. As you can say, we, we are all over the world, 57 countries. I'm proud to say I've visited 46 of them in my time. A little bit more about us, we're the only global ministry in the Society of Jesus. I report to Father Sosa, the big boss. We share in the mission of the Society. We share in the same mission that the, that the School of Envir in Environmental Sustainability, that Loyola University, Chicago shares, of making the world a, a better place, the place that Jesus wants us to make it. But I have to acknowledge that how we express that mission changes over time in response to the realities that we find ourselves dealing with. And so in that spirit, I want to talk just a little bit about how this mission is expressed, especially in response to this whole issue of climate change. And now we have hit a blank. The colors don't seem to be coming in at all. So Father Sosa began the process of developing the universal apostolic preferences in 2019. Four ideas to guide our way of moving forward in all of these crises. He said the first thing, the door to this, is sharing our, spirit, our spirituality, Ignatian spirituality, to bring us closer to God, to offer a pathway to God. And then based on that, we move ourselves into action. Knowing without doing is doing nothing. Action based on accompanying the most, those most excluded, journeying with youth, and caring for our common home. That's what the Society of Jesus, that's what the Jesuits are supposed to be doing right now. And we, as JRS, very much fit into that larger picture of what the Society is doing. And I hope the two examples that I want to show come up here, we'll find out. Asia Pacific. The Jesuits there, along with ministries and JRS, have developed a program called Caring for Communities and Creation, tying together poverty and ecological justice. The purpose is to strengthen local communities, especially communities impacted by climate change, by developing deeper partnerships with Jesuit communities and institutions. And in particular, a piece that JRS is, is part of is this 4440 tree planting project. We celebrated our 40th anniversary two years ago. 
And the Jesuits of Asia Pacific committed to planting 40,000 trees in ecological sensitive, ecologically sensitive areas in impacted communities, many of them refugee communities. And by doing this also, Pro, uh, providing the, the financial uh, foundation so that these communities could care for these new forests. So far, we've planted about 36,000 of these trees, and these have become a source of pride and income for the impacted communities where they grow. In Africa, the focus has been on developing advocacy networks in a, a number of areas where the climate change is really impacting African countries. Ecosystems, climate justice, food justice, acknowledging that mining is going to go on, but is there a greener way to do it that is less damaging to the environment and the people who live there? And one of the things that we are particularly involved in is doing agricultural projects that, uh, that teach people to adapt to climate change so that they don't have to move when the climate changes and when the crop they used to grow fails. And this picture is from a project in Northeast Nigeria that we are working in. But finally, I want to talk a little bit about JRS in particular. This is our strategic framework. I'm quite happy that it's on one page. Most of us do frameworks that are little booklets that go up on a bookshelf and, and we never see them. This is on one page, pretty succinct. Right in the middle there are our program priorities. What JRS tries to do is build projects of reconciliation, deal with mental health, education and livelihoods, and advocacy, helping people find their own voice. I think you can see how each of these can be and are being impacted by climate change. Where there are refugee and host communities, when resources get scarcer, the tension builds. If we want people to have jobs in a climate change environment, we have to prepare them to do that differently. However, you will see that in 2019, there's not a lot of talk about climate change in the strategic framework. As a matter of fact, it only shows up in that second bar. That's the only place. We have been historically climate, we've been agnostics in terms of what forces people to leave home. We deal with the fact that they have left home they are, or they are leaving home. But this whole experience of the UAP and this whole experience of not being able to push it off into the future is demanding that we change our expression of our mission to include the climate reality as we accompany and serve the people that we are called to work with. So what does our future look like? We've already started working on our next strategic framework for 2024, and the working paper is mainstreaming environmental protection. And I want to thank, I put IES, sorry, SES, we're already consulting with you to see how we can best do this. Again, we share the same mission. We are in this together. I also think that doing this is not enough. Can we become a carbon neutral JRS? This is my sort of goal. And I say this because I'm tired of listening to and smelling generators when I visit the field. If I never hear another generator, it will be fine in my life. And finally, I want to say that this process, while you and I can be talking about it here in Chicago, is ultimately going to make sense based on the experience of the people that we accompany. I put hope and resilience there. The folks that we are privileged to serve, we would not be there if they did not have hope. They would not have left home to begin with. They are hopeful, they are resilient, and they will help us figure out what the best ways are to deal with this reality of climate change and forced displacement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. And up next, Shelley Culbertson. She's Associate Director of the Disaster Management Resilience Program at the RAND Corporation. 
focusing on disaster and post-conflict recovery. She's involved in a number of um, initiatives there, which she'll talk about, but um, primarily she's led multiple studies about refugees with a particular focus on various models, return conditions, technology, and such, and she leads um, Rand's Mass Migration Strategy Group. So um, thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you, good evening. I'm, I'm really honored and excited to be here, and I'd like to thank Nancy and the, the university for the invitation, and also say what a pleasure it's been to hear uh, the perspectives of my, uh, my fellow speakers. So, um, as, as my colleagues talked about the human impact uh, and also programs to help, I'll talk a little bit about some of the data and the research as well as the national and international policy frameworks. And I'd, I'd like to leave you with just a few key takeaways, kind of bottom line up front before we start. One is that the numbers uh, of climate migrants are growing and could get really big. Uh, two, that climate migration is one cause of mass migration but there are many others, and they interact in very complex ways. Um, and, and three, national and international policy and legal frameworks are not up to the job of handling these future challenges, and they really need to be. So, um, I wanted to start by putting climate migration in the general context of mass migration for you. There are 281 million migrants in the world today. So a migrant is someone who lives in a country other than their country of origin. So I lived in Qatar, I was a migrant. Um, and most migrants are, uh, have left for economic reasons and they have gone through uh, government policies and procedures and visas. Uh, the United States has 51 million immigrants. Again, the vast majority have gone through these, these procedures. Um, we're at historic highs. That's 14% of the American population uh, with our proud history of immigration. Um, and then a figure that some of my colleagues here have also mentioned is that there are over 100 million people today forcibly displaced, 100 million refugees and internally displaced people. And this is the area where, where I've done a lot of work. I've, I've worked on some 15 studies looking at what happens to these people and how host countries manage. Uh, I think a bottom line conclusion um, from a lot of this work is that the system we have today for managing forced migration um, is broken and failing. And we can dig into that a little bit in the discussion um, as we go. And so add climate migration on, to, on top of that and uh, we're facing a lot of challenges. Um, climate migration estimates vary widely. The World Bank has estimated that there will be 143 million climate migrants in coming decades, but estimates range from 25 million to about 1.5 billion. And the reason for this huge range is that definitions really vary a lot. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a whole lot of agreement on what a climate migrant is, um, and there are also a lot of disagreement on what precisely we'll see in terms of climate change impacts. Um, some other notes I'd like to, to leave you with um, as well is that most climate migration is internal inside countries rather than crossing borders. The Asia Pacific region is bearing the brunt of uh, disasters and climate migration internally while most cross-border displacement is in Africa and the Americas. Enter disasters. Um, today, there are more displacements per year from disasters than from conflict. Um, the numbers are really big. So some 22 to 25 million people each year are displaced by weather-related disasters. Um, at the same time, more people remain displaced from conflict. So um, some 7 million have remained displaced from disasters. Um, climate is often one of multiple interacting factors on mass migration. Um, it rarely is climate the sole cause of decisions to migrate. In many cases on, on some of the islands that, 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 that Michael showed, um, 
that's it. In other cases, it's a complex uh, interaction of violence, vulnerability, poverty, and also human decisions, um, massive population growth in combination with poor urban planning um, or lack of investment in agricultural resilience, as, as Father Smolish ha had mentioned. So it's, it's, it's a combination of, of the climate, human decisions, and uh, vulnerable populations. Yet, despite all of these challenges, um, national and international climate migration policy is not sufficient for the needs of the future. On a national level, very few countries have national frameworks or plans to deal with climate migration. Bangladesh, as, as we had seen from some of Michael's work, is, is a country that does, but um, very few countries have looked forward at what this is going to mean and how they're going to address it. The United States does not currently have a climate migration um, um, plan, and yet we also are dealing with climate migration. On an international level, um, climate migrants do not have legal status as refugees, meaning they cannot access those same protections. Um, I would argue that the global system to handle refugees is already overburdened, and so there are probably much better solutions uh, to deal with climate migrants than trying to put them into a system that is uh, developed for refugees from conflict. At the same time, um, I think we are st starting to see the beginning of changes, the, the beginning of policy development. The 2018 Global Compact on Migration has recommended developing climate migration solutions, and there's a 2021 White House report on climate migration and um, that, that recommends that the United States take additional leadership in addressing this globally. I wanted to give you a few examples. Uh, climate migration is affecting many countries globally, including the United States. And here you can see uh, pictures of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, um, which uh, the, the city lost um, thousands of, of people, uh, many of whom have not returned. So the, the Syrian, I'll start with the Syrian civil war as an example. Climate was likely one of multiple factors that contributed to Arab Spring protests. The protests led to civil war, and civil war led to their refugee crisis. Um, Syria had drought in the northeast of the country in their breadbasket. That led to a lot of migration to the cities. Uh, jobs weren't available, and that led to protests. Uh, some 60% of Syria's entire population is currently displaced today. 60% of a whole country. Um, but it's also important to note that Syria had a lot of ongoing problems. The civil war probably would have happened anyway, but climate increased tensions and vulnerability. The U.S. southwest border. In recent years, there's been a surge of immigration at the, at the border. Um, uh, on the bottom, you can see a chart of numbers increasing, in particular in, in recent years. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, economic disparity, political civil conflict, and climate change are all interacting to drive people to uh, the U.S. southwest border. Um, historically, most of the people coming had been single adults from Mexico seeking economic opportunity. But what we're seeing is a shift to more families and children from Central America. Um, and studies are showing that climate change is a big driver of that. Um, and finally, um, Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Rico's population, depicted here, had been rising for many years. Um, in the past couple of decades, it has been dropping quickly. Um, hurricanes have been one factor uh, that has contributed to this. There have been other factors, an energy crisis, economic problems, uh, Puerto Rico's a, a US territory and people can migrate to the continental United States but in particular, after 2017's hurricanes or Amon Maria, 400,000 people left Puerto Rico. So what can be done about this? There are things that can be done about this, but this requires complex governance and institutional um, organization and approaches. Um, humankind has risen to complex challenges before, and we can do it again, but it does take work and leadership. 
some ideas of things that can be done, uh, reducing the impact of disasters by investing in improving the built environment and agriculture, codes and standards, insurance, et cetera. Um, developing national and international frameworks uh, for policies about how people uh, can migrate uh, along with migration uh, processes and pathways. Um, as the United States taking leadership, um, we can't pay for all, everything uh, and we can't take everybody who's been displaced, but we can step up and lead other countries and help develop solutions. And finally, gathering better data about this so that we have the information needed to solve problems. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> we are a few minutes behind, but um, we'll have the opportunity to get in some good conversation because after all, that's why you came. Um, and so, um, you know, I want to begin with, um, with um, Eva and since um, it's late for you, and so I want to make sure I get <laughs> all of the energy you have left uh, when we bring you back up. Um, it's interesting in that the work you've been doing um, sometimes can come in conflict. Uh, well, this kind of work always comes in conflict with government, but you are especially vulnerable. Um, I think of a, a phrase by James Baldwin, this means to act is to be committed and to be committed is to be in danger. Can you talk about any obstacles or um, some of the roadblocks you've encountered, especially considering how um, people in environmental justice movements outside of, in many countries, are at risk um, and have been assassinated, like um, Berta Caceres, the 2015 winner of the Goldman Prize, um, the um, most prominent environmental prize, and then a year later she was assassinated for her work in um, opposing um, um, dam um, construction there. And so um, can you talk a little bit about some of any potential or real challenges you've had to encounter in doing this work? Oh, thank you so much, Steve for the, the question. This, uh, and this really to the degree, if you're comfortable, I don't want you to say anything that could je put you in jeopardy in any way, so I want to be very sensitive to that. All right, so thank you so much for that. Um, well, growing up in uh, in Zimbabwe, um, you, you see that refugees, being a refugee, we go through quite uh, a number of, of of challenges, you know, um, from uh, the political side. I mean, the, the laws itself were restricted in uh, quite a, 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 num a number of things. Uh, for example, um, things to do with uh, like work, work permits. And so it's really w one of those uh, things that limits us in terms of uh, work itself because we are unable to do, uh, it's, it's really hard for a, a, a small startup of, 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 as a refugee to actually uh, to, to scale up. Uh, and sometimes being a refugee, um, we lack access to, 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 financial, to financial sources like, um, Sometimes you have a, a big idea you want to implement, but then to get getting support to uh, implement the, the project is, is, is quite a challenge. So finances is one of the critical challenges, uh, especially when it comes to 
refugee youth-led uh, initiatives. So without financing, definitely we are restricted to uh, remaining at uh, uh, basically not, not, not really uh, addressing the, the challenges that are faced uh, within the community. And also as uh, from, I, I'll speak from the, the perspective of uh, refugee youth-led initiatives because uh, I personally am a refugee. So some of the challenges also as, 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 as refugee youth-led initiatives, some of the challenges that we face as well uh, is on the other side of capacity building and that uh, we are unable to scale up uh, uh, our work and at the same time uh, there are so many refugees who wants to implement uh, di different projects within uh, th their communities but they don't have uh, the required uh, skills so we see that their work is not um, that effective. Um, so I think for now, th those are uh, some of the things that, that I would say that we, yeah. we, we mainly uh, lake in terms of financial, financial as well as capacity building. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So on that theme of um, being in, uh, of these challenges and roadblocks, and you're, you're dealing with people, you know, Michael, um, father, uh, you've met people, who you think they're stateless, essentially, um, and they are extremely vulnerable, uh, and you are attempting to, not only are you drawing in, you know, you're observing, drawing in resources, but then you're sort of seeing the push and the pull between forces that are, may not necessarily prioritize um, the safety um, and of, of these refugees. And so uh, how do you navigate that? And then, you know, Michael, when you're filming, what were, the, were there moments where you could see that there were certain buttons you couldn't push or there were certain zones where if you're going into, you, you could be at some risk? Yeah, it was, it was a challenge because going to 48 countries we just had so many translators, um, and, and you know, as that movie says, lost in translation. Um, and so we were just really, the entire film crew, hyper sensitive and hyper alert to almost read their body language as well, um, just to make sure that we you know, weren't offending them. We, 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 did, we learned something very early on that if we showed up you know, with as small as our crew was, and we pulled the cameras out and just started asking questions, um, we didn't get very far. Mm -hmm. And so what we would do is we would, you know, spend three or four days in an area, get to know people, let them get to know us, um, and kind of share with them our overall mission on, on what, you know, how we would like to take their story and send it to the United Nations and send it to the leaders of the world um, in hopes of, of bringing change. But yeah, there's always, um, I, I, it, it, it's a tough question for me to ask just because of all of the translation issues. Yeah. Um, um, Father? Let me follow up on that. And I think it's an, it's an interesting policy issue. I think it would, uh, uh, as you were talking, Yves, something came to my mind. I agree with you that I'm not sure we need a climate refugee designation. I'm not, the, the current refugee law is incredibly convoluted. But the fact that there is no protection, there is no, in a sense, legal status for people forced to flee for climate and other reasons makes them very vulnerable, both in leaving the path to get wherever they get, and then even there, the, the, uh, vul the, vul the vulnerabilities are incredible. If I could make one change, it would be interesting to see what you think. My change would be 
that once, when, when somebody is seen as legitimately forcibly displaced, she or he gets a work permit. I think this would be the thing that changes and liberates so many people in this, in this situation. Yves, my recollection is that most refugees in Zimbabwe cannot legally work outside of the camp and, and whatever. Right. It's yep. a complicated issue to work inside of a camp. We're not gonna go there. But that would change the picture. That's part of the CRRF. It's part of the 2019 Global Accords. Many countries, I think, are fearful because they imagine their economy as a pie, and if I let more people in, they will take my piece of the pie, rather than seeing that the pie grows when you allow people, especially many refugees are, frankly, risk takers, entrepreneurial, willing to stretch in order to do things. So the protection that I would give is enabling people to have a, have a legal livelihood and that won't solve anything, right. won't solve everything, but I think would make a real difference in giving people a stability and sort of a basis in which they can help, help us in our task of helping them adapt to these new realities. Any thoughts on that? Yes, I, that's exactly what I would have said in different words. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think that, I think that's the crux of the, the problem with the global refugee structures that are in place. Mm -hmm. So in, in most countries of the world where there are large refugee populations, um, refugees do not have the legal right to work. Um, many are in camps um, where they often remain for decades or generations. Um, there's fear that people from a different ethnic group um, may integrate, or there's often fear that, that a young energetic population may compete with the local, local labor market, uh, and, and that ends up often being a justification for not allowing people to work. What that does is keep people in dependence for decades, right. rather than allowing them to develop their own human capital, contribute, have the dignity of supporting themselves, um, and once people get refugee status, they can often be stuck in it mm -hmm. for very long times without these rights. Mm -hmm. And so if we were going to, as a, as, as, as a world, design a system to help climate migrants, I think forcing them into a system that is failing in many ways place, yeah. is probably not the best solution, but rather developing other migration pathways where primarily they can work, they can go to school, they can integrate, get health insurance, rent housing rather live in camp, but than live in camps. And that's a different approach. And there are some countries that are doing that with refugees. The EU is doing that with the Ukrainians. They granted them um, temporary protection status that gives rights to work. Uh, the United States, when we take refugees, um, they have the right to work. Um, Colombia, I think, is an excellent model. Um, it has given Venezuelans who are coming there uh, right to work, mm -hmm. healthcare, education. Mm -hmm. And so if we could design something that doesn't trap people in camps and dependency for years, but instead allows them to move on, integrate, support themselves, use their skills and entrepreneurship, that would be a much better system. I would just add, uh, Uganda is a great example of this. Acknowledging that Uganda right now has, is the largest receiving country of forcibly displaced people in Africa, over, I think it's about 1.5 million. They've always had a welcoming policy. The economy has grown. The number of refugee-led businesses, the, uh, the number of uh, uh, Ugandans working for refugee businesses is stunning. How do we help people realize, yes, it's not easy, and I would uh, agree with you, but I think giving people the right to make their own uh, decisions. And I think our job then becomes, what does education look like? What does livelihoods training look like? What does, I would say, reconciliation, helping these social fabrics either be re-knit or knit differently with different people? I think that's what we need. In a sense, there's some expert global expertise out there in helping individual countries make those sorts of moves. But I totally agree with that. If I could add one other thing to that, I'll geek out a little bit, is, is education. Because often refugee populations are kept uh, separate from 
uh, from local host community populations. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we've seen how well segregation turns out in our, in our own country, it just doesn't. And when that lasts for years, that has a lot of repercussions. To the, the point that 50% um, of refugee children are not in school because of some of these challenges. So if we instead developed ways for refugees, climate migrants, whatever reason people are migrating, to be able to integrate, go to school, get a job, rent a house, um, that would be a much better way than trying to retroactively fit right. people into failing legal systems. Yeah. Eva, I'm gonna, we're going to come back to you shortly. Um, Shelley, you had mentioned that climate refugees don't qualify under international law for refugee status. And uh, Michael, um, before we came on, you talked about how you've talked to a number of these leaders in the UN and elsewhere. Uh, talk about some of the things that uh, they discuss where you sort of realize there's more they could do but they're not doing and the reasons why they're not doing it or, the things they, or their frustrations and why, for example, something that would seem so easy to solve doesn't exist. So what are those backroom conversations? Yeah, it, it, it kind of tails and on, on, dovetails on what, what was just being talked about. First of all, I, I should say, although the United Nations has used our, our 2010 film as a tool um, all around the world multiple times, they were not happy with me titling it Climate Refugees. Mm -hmm. And an interesting side note is the United Nations had not officially coined these people anything until two years after the movie came out. And they're officially called environmentally induced migrants at this point. And so I think it's important that, you know, climate refugees is not really the proper term. And the reason that they have such an issue with this is, is exactly what Shelley is saying. If you put the refugee after it and you can prove that they were persecuted against through the industrial, industrialized re resolution and they add that into the Geneva Convention, I believe that they're in fear that the Geneva Convention will, will implode. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, this is, the other thing that's interesting about, there are so many verticals within the United Nations that climate migration people fit within. Um, everybody's trying to grab, you know, a section of this simply because they understand that it's going to drive a lot of conversation in the future. You know, we, we in a completely different subject, but we, we sat down with the Pentagon. You know, one of their biggest concerns in the future is the humanitarian consequences of climate change and managing all of that as people start crossing borders. Um, so yeah, I mean, the United Nations is trying to figure this out along with a lot of other people. I, I, I actually I like what, what you guys are saying, and this is what's so awesome about like when we made this movie, there were none of these conversations going on. Mm -hmm. And just to see where the conversation has taken place within the last decade, um, it's enlightening, like it's inspiring. Because these people do have hope, you know? They're not ready to give up on their life. I think sending them somewhere where they can, you know, have a job and, and be purposeful and feel good about themselves, it's, it's amazing what happens when that when that takes place. Yeah, an interesting story about uh, when you put, create the website. Yeah, well, yeah, so, you know, th nothing.com is available, right? And that was true back in 2008 as well. And so halfway through our journey, you know, I decided, well, yeah, I think I'm gonna call this Climate Refugees. And they're like, oh man, I don't know if I do that. I'm like, no, it's like, it's, it's the right title for this. And so I went to godaddy.com and, you know, thinking that, oh man, I hope like .natter.org is available. And when .com was available, I was like, wow, we, like, this is not being tracked right now. Um, and that was really an aha moment for, for, for us that, you know, there's something special here. The other aha moment, which I spoke to you about earlier, I was in Poland and I was trying to get an interview with the Kim Steiner, who was the head of uh, UNEP at that point, and his schedule was like, he doesn't have time. And back then, the United Nations would not take my calls. They you know, could care less about what I was doing. And so I literally, like, after the scheduler would not let me sit down with them, I saw Akim eating lunch by himself and I just, I sat down and I was like, sir, I am sorry, but you're gonna watch these eight minutes of film or 10 minutes of film that I have. And he watched it and he was like, oh my God, like how much more do you have? And I said, we have you know, 200 hours of this right now. 
and we've been to all these countries, and he was like, we are just starting to wrap our arms around this. I want to fly you to, you know, Bonn, Germany, and I want you to meet some people. And after that, the UN, you know, kind of really helped us out. So um, this is a big issue for them, and I don't think anybody has the answers at this point. Eva, um, oh, go on. No. When you speak to um, leaders, um, politicians, or potential, you know, wealthy donors or people in power, um, what are those conversations like? Do you feel like you're being taken seriously? Do you feel like um, you're getting the support that you need and that the people you're trying to help need? Oh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, so, uh, during uh, different conferences that I, I attend, uh, or whenever I get the chance to to converse with uh, leaders uh, or donors, I really think that it's it's really something that. Um, it's somehow, um, in terms of uh, seriousness, I think at some point, yes. Uh, but I think there is always a lack of, uh, for example, I mentioned the idea of uh, financing. So, Financing is really something that's really a challenge in terms of uh, scaling up the work of, uh, of refugee youth led initiatives, or basically when we are advocating. So in terms of being taken serious, I think there is more work to be done on that because I, I really, I, I feel that uh, there is more need for, for, for I mean, for, for, to have refugees, you know, being at the center. And so I think refugees should be included uh, within the decision making. Uh, refugees should be included um, in every, every aspect. And also, um, recently we, we see that, uh, we see a lot of uh, advocates advocating on the localization of, of, uh, of humanitarian aid. Because somehow we see that probably there might be funds available at some point, but if we look at the actual work the actual work being implemented within the camp or within the refugee settlement, we see that it's, it's, there's no accountability. So I think there is also a huge work to, to be done in terms of accountability. I think donors should be accountable to uh, some of uh, the, the work that they do uh, on, on the side of, of refugees. And so we, we see a lot of movement, so, uh, we see a lot of refugees who are advocating uh, for refugee inclusion because I think inclusion is something that's very paramount and something that's limi limited. Thank you. I, I'm struck by both what uh, Eve said about the question of inclusion, and Mike, your comments in terms of working with with the UN. So I want to I want to suggest that the problem, if I can use that word, I refuse to call it a crisis. It, there's a there's an organizational crisis, there's a leadership crisis, but 100 million people in a world of seven billion, we should be able to figure something out. I think. Um, uh, and I, I've been living in Italy for eight, eight years, and I want to acknowledge Italy has borne the brunt 
of some very poor policy in the EU, Italy and Greece. And so I'm sympathetic to right now a very strong anti-immigrant feeling in Italy. At the same time, Italy is the second oldest country in the world. The birth rate is negligible. And there are already migrants from all over the world keeping those little towns that we go to visit going. Uh, if there weren't Syrians and Afghanis and all sorts of other people there, Italy would collapse. So on the one hand, we've got this dynamic of we can't let them in. But as a matter of fact, we have let them in. And if we don't let them in, it's all going to fall apart. So I think my question is, what stops us from having the policy decisions? What stops us from acknowledging the client there are refugees, there are people being forced to leave because of climate. What stops us from including refugee voices? I think it's fundamentally fear. We're afraid of what's going to happen when they, whoever they is, show up. And I just, you know, in working with this all these years, this is a spiritual problem, fundamentally. It's, you know, fear leads to anxiety. It's a great way to motivate people to protest and to do all sorts of things, but it's a terrible way to make decisions. And I think our decision-making processes at this point are locked in fear. And I think it's a, I just want to say it's, a, I, you know, I get to say that, but I think it's true. It's fundamentally a spiritual crisis. From an Ignatian point of view, this is a disordered affection. We're stuck on something that on some level makes us feel good, keeping those people out. So I think the real challenge for us, part of the Jesuit network, part of the, part of the Jesuit world, is how do we move to that deeper level? How do we move to deeper conversations? Pope Francis is constantly, you know, and, and he's gotten become more and more clear on this. Very important thing, he says, we are one community. We are one reality. We're not the refugees and us or this and that. And if you really take that as a starting point, that potentially changes things. But it's a hard place to get to right now because there's a lot of voices and a lot of social media and a lot of echo chambers right. that really say we aren't. Right. And yet I think we have to believe and act as if we are. Father, you, you spoke about mainstreaming environmental protection. And um, Shelley, that's something that the work that you're doing um, is pr playing a significant role in because it's, you're pulling in stakeholders and audiences and presenting these facts uh, and undeniable facts in a, in a way that can create points of entry for these various stakeholders. Can you talk about that role and the work that you do and how it's creating sort of a mainstreaming in circles where normally those conversations weren't happening? Yeah, um, so I, I do a lot of work um, in, in disaster recovery in, in the last couple of years, in particular in the Caribbean, you know, US territories, Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands. Um, and some, some insights that have been very striking from this work are that there's a lot of the response that's in our control. The climate is not in our control, or it, it, it is in a bigger picture, we could stop emitting, et cetera, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's not in our, our control right now. But we do have control over, over how risks are handled to the climate. So a hurricane can hit, but if buildings are built to, to m the most modern codes and, and they're not, um, um, there aren't a lot of settlements and flood zones, et cetera, et cetera. There are ways of mitigating the risks so that it's not hitting the poorest and the most vulnerable um, people causing such mass migration and pain and suffering. And so the extent to which we can start using human ingenuity to mitigate the risks of climate change. So disasters are happening. I mean, they're happening with increasing severity and frequency in the United States globally. But we also have, we have technology, policies, tools, investments that we can't stop all of that, but we can at least reduce a lot of the impact um, if we really <coughs> mobilized to do so. So uh, I, we're wrapping. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I would just say with, with, with regards to Father's comments, one of the things that I've noticed where this conversation just gets shut down is when it comes to financing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I've thought about in this film, and, and I, I, perhaps I need to speak more to folks like yourself, I believe 
that there may be a value in cutting this climate issue in half and putting on one half of, half of it the carbon issue, how we solve the carbon issue. Because the carbon issue is not allowing us to focus on what I would consider the other half is the humanitarian issue. And I think as soon as you kind of draw that hard line between these two, you start making people accountable for things where right now it just seems to be chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, as we wrap, uh, Michael, I wanted to, uh, a friend of mine, um, Ben Whitehouse, um, who's um, a climate um, activist and um, Sky Day Project, and his brother is a cultural anthropologist, and he made the comment that you don't change people's minds with facts. You change their minds through the heart. Mm -hmm. And that the arts, you know, that is the tool really to reach the human heart, to bring to, so that you can bring people together who normally wouldn't agree on anything and then grab them in a moment where they all die together, right? Suffer together. Um, and we saw that when these young people were singing, you know, just, it was amazing. So can you talk about, you know, why you as an artist um, decided, you, just your understanding of what you can do through art that you normally couldn't do otherwise. It's, it's interesting because we use that very exact term. You sell the facts through the heart in documentary filmmaking. Um, for me, it's all about universal themes. When you can tap into universal themes and focus on, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Joseph Campbell and his philosophy on storytelling and mythology, but when you can zone in on the wants and the needs of your lead character, it's amazing what will happen and, and how wide of a net you can cast with the audience. So yeah, it's for me, it's universal themes. It's what we call in Hollywood four quadrant filmmaking, which is young, old, male, female. Um, and it's just, you know, when this first, when this film first came out, I had articles challenging me, well, all the people that are in this movie are beautiful, like, well, why didn't you show the people with, you know, the flies in the eyes and all of this and all of that? And I, I, was, I, was, I was, like, baffled. I was like, I was, we captured the, the human face of climate change, the beauty of who these people are. And so, and I created those faces because I knew when people looked within the eyes of these children or these women, um, it's hard not to start identifying with the truth and the facts. Mm. You can't run from that. No, Father. Um, Let me just add to the point. Yeah, I would uh, agree with you, Michael. And we have found that a refugee telling her story is the way to change yes. hearts. People realize we have much more in common with one another than uh, whatever separates us. Yes. Absolutely right. Yep. Yes. Quickly, you spoke play, about. Can I make a play for the data go. in addition to the yeah. arts and the heart? Uh, <laughs> great. Yeah, absolutely. So, Good. So, as as we've studied um, mass migration, immigration, etc., um, I, I find compelling. The numbers, and the numbers are often that um, when, when, when refugees go to a new place, there's often an, an initial uh, huge amount of expense in, in helping those people, helping them get settled, et cetera. But in the long run, they're contributing to the economy. And so if we fra reframe the conversation away from how, how, how can countries better keep out refugees, climate migrants, et cetera, which is often where it goes, and instead look at this in a win-win in a, in a situation. Um, you, know, you were mentioning labor markets, right? There, there are lots of places in the United States that have labor market shortages, lots of places in Europe that are depopulating exactly. with labor market shortages. There are ways of structuring these projected mass movements of humanity so that they're beneficial and orderly um, and not creating the sense of, of, of chaos and fear, et cetera. Uh, but it has to be deliberate. It, if, if we just let it happen, it won't be deliberate and be causing this type of fear. I would uh, agree with you, but I'm, I'm going to push back slightly and say I think that fear piece, which is irrational, gets in the way of people hearing that truth, which is totally, totally accurate. Um, and I think the challenge for all of us is to to find ways, to, again, to bring people together to look at those realities rather than polarizing ourselves into, you know, I don't want them in my 
daughter's classroom, yep. mm -hmm. and uh, et cetera. So. Last question um, for you, Eva, and we'll let you go to bed. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, what do you need? What can we do? What can people do to help you in your efforts? Um, thank you so much, Steve. So I think um, basically having, um, considering uh, the voices uh, of refugees, I think is in terms of, uh, I talked about inclusion. And I think being included, uh, it's something that's, uh, that's very important included on uh, international platforms as well to have, you know, refugees uh, speak from their own uh, experiences as well, to have refugees included within uh, the decision making. I think uh, that's one of the things that's very crucial. And also then besides uh, the inclusion of refugees at a global level, I think there's also, uh, I think in terms of financial support, in terms of implementing uh, different projects, bringing, scaling up some of the work that we do at a local level to a global level. I think it's something that's really life-changing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eva Umaholza, Father Tom Smolik, Shelley Culbertson, and Michael Nash. Thank you all so much, and thank you all for being with us. And here comes the boss. <laughs> That was really exciting. I thought it was going to be a total bummer uh, conversation, but I learned so much and I, I got a lot of hope from that and I think the singers really brought that, um, brought that to home. What did they say? It takes courage to care. And what I heard as the wrap up here was all about, you know, love, not fear. And you have to lean into love even though it's hard and it requires a lot of courage. So I just want to thank you all for participating. I'm sorry we didn't have time to do Q&A, but I would have liked to have let those guys go on for another hour. Um, Thank you, Steve Byam. You're a terrific moderator, and my provost was saying, we got to get him to come get a com commencement speech for us. <laughs> so uh, I'll be knocking on your door. Uh, thank you, Father Smolich. It was really interesting to hear what Jesuit Refugee Services is doing and your perspective on all this, and the same with you, Shelley. Um, your international perspective was really helpful, and it was really cool to, to hear about your um, experiences with this, and you took courage to just jump into a, an idea that you had, you know, really, you were kind of blind going into this, and I think we all learned a lot from your first um, uh, documentary and look forward to the second one. I just want to take one minute to thank all the people that put this thing together because it really does take a lot of work to uh, make an event like this happen. I'd like to give a call out to the the people in the School of Environmental Sustainability who are on the Climate Change Conference Committee. And I'll start with Margaret Helwich and, and Stephanie Folk. They really pulled this together. <laughs> and I also, wanna, I also wanna thank Rachel Lehman, Allison Carr, Megan Conway, Kevin Erickson, Aniko Ross, and Zach Wakeman. And a big thanks to Jenny Gallo who's over in special events and her team, they were really helpful. Thank you all for participating and those that you are here virtually really appreciate. Come on out and have a little reception with us. Thanks again.